We are now live, sound check. Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee meeting for Monday, November 21st, 2022, sound check.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. It's great to see everyone. Um, I'd like to call uh, this meeting of our Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee to order. Please be advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. <coughs> Presentations and reports considered at this meeting are available on the City's website, and members of the public can contact the Clerk's Office to acquire documents in an alternative format. A revised order of business was approved at Council in September, and we will be following that order today. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Councillor Cameron Kretsch. Welcome to our committee. Uh, Cameron is joining us as our, our newest member of the Municipal Heritage Committee. As we begin, we'll do a roll call. If I can just get everyone to acknowledge their presence as I go through the, uh, the list. Councillor Kretsch. Present. Janice Brown. We see you, Janice. <laughs> Just wave. That's Present. <laughs> Karen Burke. Present. Graham Carroll. Present. Charles Dimitri. Lynn Lundstedt. Present, although, Madam Chair, I will have to leave at 10 o'clock for a previous appointment. Sounds good. Uh, Robin McKee. Present. Timothy Rich. And Will Rosart. Present. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. Under communications, we have item 5.1, correspondence respecting the recommendation to designate 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue, West Hamilton. The recommendation is that it be received and referred to item 8.1 on this agenda for consideration. 5.1A, uh, I, Langley. 5.1B, A, Region Strife. 5.1C, C. Redmond, President, Duran Neighborhood Association. 5.2, correspondence from C. Redford, President Duran Association respecting heritage permit application HB 2022026 for 163 Jackson Street West. The recommendation for that is that it be re received and referred to item 8.2 on this agenda for consideration. And the uh, item 5.3, notice of passing of bylaw number 22258 to designate a portion of Mill Street in Dundas as a heritage conservation district study area under section 40.1 of the Ontario Heritage Act and that be received. And a delegation from Re Matt Johnston, Urban Solutions Planning and Development, respecting the re recommendation to designate 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue West. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, would you like a motion for the agenda as amended? Or? I certainly would. Excuse me. Oh. Excuse me. Do you have questions? Uh, uh, no, um, there is an omission, and I'd like to note it, please. Uh, Shannon Kyles uh, submitted a delegation request to speak on behalf of both 66 and 68 Charlton Avenue West and 30 South Street Dundas. And uh, that should be noted. I think she is in the council chambers to speak to both of those points. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. L Lorraine, if you'd like to comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Janice, those items are on the original agenda, so they would not be included at this moment when we discuss changes to the agenda. I have the original, sorry, I have the original agenda and it's not on, so maybe I'm, I photocopied this uh, or printed it too soon. Okay, no, no, no that's, that's great. Thank you for bringing that to the, uh, the, uh, our attention, Janice, so we'll, we'll get that clarified. And you. Robin, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, is the... Um, um, uh, staff uh, willing to talk about uh, Bill 23. Uh, I believe that's coming up later in the agenda. Okay, thank uh, you. We can, we can ask, you can ask questions as that item yep. comes forward. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rob. May I have a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended? I see Graham and I see Karen. Is there anyone opposed to that amendment? Seeing none, that item is carried. And we move on to our declarations of interest. Are there any declarations today? Seeing none, we will move on to item 4.1, which is the approval of our minutes from the previous meeting. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes as presented for September 15th, 2022? I believe Janice has a question. Uh, not a question. Again, um, just uh, 
correction or an edit, I think. And uh, if we go to delegation, sorry, sorry, sorry. If we go to delegations, it says item nine. I'm on page six of 10 in those minutes. And it is the second motion that was made. It does read, it says this, is incorrect that the inventory and research working group monitor the property located at 6668 Charlton Avenue West. Uh, it should read that the uh, property at located at 6668 Charlton Avenue West Hamilton be referred to inventory and research working group for further discussion for potential designation under part four Ontario Heritage Act. And that comes from the staff report, uh, so it is correct. And that's exactly what happened at our last meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Janice. Is there any other questions before we move forward? Otherwise, can I may I have a, a mover and a seconder for our meeting notes? <coughs> Sorry, I see Graham and I see Karen. Is there anyone opposed? So Madam Clerk, uh, Councillor Kretsch just wanted to note that he was that he was not present for the meeting. Um, he just wanted to note that. Thank you. And as we move on to communication items, we have several communication items on the agenda today. Um, are there any questions from the committee members in regards to items I to, um, uh, so it's the, uh, the three items under correspondence. No questions? If not, may I have a motion to approve those items as presented? I see Will, I need a seconder, and I see Graham. Is there anyone opposed to receiving those as approved? Seeing none, that item is carried. Our delegation requests, we have two delegations for today's meeting, um, and we've listed those. We have Shannon Kyles and we have Matt Johnson here. Um, are there any questions regarding those delegations? If not, may I have a move, mover and a seconder to approve those delegation requests? Just a second. Question. Go ahead, Janice. Uh, please, uh, if you could confirm that Shannon Kyles will indeed have the opportunity to present 30 South Street West Dundas Osler House. Thank you. Yes, so we've actually spoken with, with Shannon prior to the meeting, so she'll be presenting uh, five minutes for both properties that are on the Thank agenda. you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a mover and a seconder? I see Councillor Crutch and I see Graham. And is there anyone opposed? Seeing that none, that item is carried and we'll have our presentations. So uh, to begin, I'd like to please welcome Shannon Kyles, Architectural Conservancy of Ontario representative from the Hamilton branch, uh, respecting the recommendation to designate 68, or pardon me, 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue West in Hamilton. And Shannon will also be speaking uh, in regards to 60 South Street in Dundas. Thank so you. welcome Shannon. And, and as we mentioned, you'll have five minutes for, uh, for each of those properties. So if you, uh, we'll, we'll begin with uh, 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue. No, it's not. That's the first slide, thank you. Okay, sorry for the de delay, technical difficulties as always. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here today to present these uh, two properties. The first one, 6668 Charlton Avenue, is a Queen Anne revival which shows the um, transition between the Victorian and the Edwardian age. This is actually a bit rare in some circumstances. You'll notice that this door has um, a keystone that is strictly Edwardian. One of my professors used to call it um, King Eddie's crown. You find them a lot on Aberdeen and um, Ravenscliff in the Edwardian houses there. 
So it's a, a wonderful transitional piece. You've got the dentals along the band there. And also that's on um, 68, and this is 66, which has a rather rare Corbell table. So the Corbell table, is it's not found um, very often in Hamilton. Aside from that, they're just two really well-designed, well-built buildings. Um, we know both the architect and the builder of both of them. And um, this is important as well because it fits into the context of the neighborhood. The buildings themselves are architectural gems. But almost more importantly is their position within the neighborhood. What they do is they provide a massing that is away from the street that provides a friendly and inviting walking space. You'll notice that most of the newer suburbs um, it, it, they're not walkable, not simply because they don't have sidewalks, often some of them do, but in the newer suburbs and the newer um, housing developments, the owners tend to want to use every legal square foot of space on the property and the um, part of the property that is not covered by the humongous house is then hardscaped so that the trees and the bushes and everything else can be maintained by some of the other than the owner in most cases. So these are not, they're not as welcoming neighborhoods because the massing is just too large. With this and with most of the other properties in the Duran neighborhood, the um, properties are well back from the street and provide trees and wildlife and bushes, etc., that provide um, habitat for <coughs> wildlife that is frankly disappearing. So. This is the overall look of the building, which if uh, you wanted to put it into four, even five different apartment buildings, I had actually an apartment building much like this on the corner of Hess and Hunter back in the 80s. And um, they could, they, they make themselves into wonderful condos. Here's the um, other building, which is not quite as architecturally interesting, but it does have that wonderful Corbell table. Now, um, what these two buildings represent is a time in Hamilton when there was a rather, um, certainly quite affluent community that built houses that were friendly and inviting to everyone. Certainly they would have had servants, etc. Nowadays we don't need that because we've got all the heating, etc. But these houses are very important within the context particularly of the Duran neighborhood. And the Duran neighborhood is almost intact, which is unusual in Hamilton and almost anywhere else in, in Canada. You will not find a neighborhood that is quite that intact. So I think that any time that you take one of the houses that is part of this neighborhood and change it or uh, make it into a modern development, I think we're losing something much more important than just the one or two houses. We're, what we're doing is chipping away at something that is really unique in Hamilton. And a well-preserved neighborhood like that is worth its weight in gold. Now, what is going to happen to these properties, um, hopefully that'll work, is apparently it's going to be taken down for speculation. And what this means, anybody who's driven down the center of Ancaster, um, maybe once every five years for the last 40 years, what this means is that you have these beautiful old houses that one by one get taken down, and this is what's left. I did this map last year um, in response to the um, green space and sprawl. What you see, the red marks there, this is between Bay Street and Mary and uh, Hunter and I think Wilson. The red is the places that have been taken down speculation and most of them are now parking lots. As you can see, there's actually plenty of room to do development without taking out the gorgeous old buildings that are and provide in times of pandemics, just to take an example at random, something easily walkable for people who need a break and need some mental health. Questions about this map? Okay, I guess my time is up. So I, I'm voting to save these buildings because of their context and because what's gonna happen to them isn't worth doing. Ding, okay. Am I on to the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. How exciting. Thank you. Okay, this is the uh, William Osler House that's at 30 South Street 
on, in Dundas. It is part of a neighborhood of buildings that were built during the 1840s and 1850s. Um, this one belonged to Sir William Osler, who was the father of modern medicine and was part of um, many discoveries. He was also the person who um, put together the idea of training physicians with actual patients in the, Ham in the uh, Ontario context. So William Osler House is fantastic. You will also find the, the Osler Building, which is on um, King Street, no, it's Main Street in Dundas, and it is the Second Empire Building that became the um, Freemason Lodge. It's now hopefully going to get a restaurant in it, which is about time. And it's a gorgeous building. Another Osler building in Dundas is run by the Salvation Army, and that's Ellen Osler, who donated her house to women just leaving um, prison so that they could. So this is part of a, a huge context of the important families that did a lot for the neighborhood. Why I think this one should be um, designated is that the people who have owned it for the last 16 years, who admittedly are good friends of mine, have an absolutely incredible job of taking it from really a mess. It looked not bad, but almost as bad as the 66, 68 Charlton houses boarded up. In some cases, these gorgeous pillars were um, an absolute wreck. And um, I'm now working on Scott Burnham's porch for the uh, front of his house, and I've got some similar columns. And Gary, um, the owner of this house, is going to help me restore them because honestly, he's, he's, he's the bomb. Okay, here it is from the side, has a gorgeous entranceway on the left-hand side of the photograph. You can also see a cucumber magnolia, which is, I think, designated as well. Okay, the doors, this is an interesting mix of, of course, neoclassical and Italianate um, during the time period to get a building permit, which you didn't even have to have. You didn't have to say, okay, every element of this building is gonna be neoclassical, that's it, that's all, so you can have an Italianate door. There's loads of different elements in the building, but they all are cohesive and they're all beautifully restored. Everything is pristine, the hardware, everything. Okay, this is a gorgeous, um, the reason why I think this is not difficult to designate and will be of no particular difficulty for the new owners is that um, all of the windows have been fitted with storms and um, I'd be happy to send anybody who's interested all my documentation on the fact that restored doors and windows are in fact more energy efficient than new ones and if you take a 200 or 400 year context for them they will last a long longer so by designating this house what we're doing is maintaining the integrity of it and also making sure that people who are less um, educated in what older building is all about that they have a chance whereas if a new person who wanted to come in and, and just change the whole thing um, would probably be backed up by modern legislation. Okay, so here we have the beautiful um, classical portico, the Gordon Free Centered Arch, beautiful eaves. Um, the outside has about 60% original windows. The other 40% are new, but they have been built um, to fit in with the exterior. The interior has gorgeous molding, moldings. Note the rosettes here, I, sadly I can't zoom in, but the rosettes are beautiful. And um, there are, are many of these bookcases on the main level that have the same sort of uh, detailing. And another thing that's important are the fireplaces. Certainly, as an 1840s house, it wouldn't have had electricity. The previous owners are quite interested in um, keeping all the chandeliers, which, of course, wouldn't have been there when it was built. So I don't actually share that, but I definitely believe that the fireplaces and the um, all the other cabinetry and the moldings should be maintained. This is in such perfect condition um, that I think that the, the current owners will be able to do whatever it is they want to do with this building without being in any way hindered by it being um, designated. There's no work to be done. It's all ready to go. Um, the newel posts are another, <laughs> they're absolutely, I mean, it's absolutely stunning, isn't it? And the um, staircases, and look at the side, you can see the side of the um, rail there, here. All of that, all of that has been beautifully um, maintained and stripped and repainted um, by Gary and Sarah. 
who sold it to McMaster University. Anyway, I believe that this is dead easy. Here's the carriage house. I could live in the carriage house. It's fantastic. And it's all original. You've got the doors of the stables. They'll shut up. <laughs> this should be designated because it's absolutely pristine and it's never going to get any better than it is now. And they just have to take it over and maintain it. That's all they have to do. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Thank you, Shannon, for that presentation. Be before you step away, do are there any questions from our committee members for, for Shannon? Janice has a question. Hello, um, Janice Brown. Um, thank you, Shannon. Uh, just uh, to let everybody else know who is perhaps in the audience in chambers um, or who's listening in or who's around the table. Uh, Shannon, um, I'm going to speak about both homes. Uh, Shannon did come to our last uh, inventory and research working group uh, meeting and there was a recommendation uh, by I and R to move to Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee to indeed um, designate uh, this project property and put it on staff's work list. So Shannon, I thank you for this presentation. It is a beautiful home and I do believe that we have to educate our people. Um, and I totally agree with you on that as did the inventory and research people. Going back to 6668, again, thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, your knowledge on architecture, et cetera, is outstanding. And uh, people need to hear those things. And thank you for uh, describing the Duran neighborhood as you did. Uh, it is a gem in the heart of the city. Um, and again, inventory and research, um, we were uh, we were asked to do a preliminary investigation, which we did. It was fairly easy because staff had already done some great work uh, when they were doing the Duran Built Heritage invitation um, inventory. And having said that, we also recommended that this move forward to be designated under part four and it be an emergency designation as we are concerned with what the um, property owner has in mind, uh, knowing uh, the state of the building that uh, he basically neglected it. And I, I think that that is an absolute shame. And I do, I do know that it didn't look that way perhaps even a year ago. I live three or four blocks from there. I'm on that street often. So thank you, Shannon, and uh, thank you to Inventory and Research Working Group for agreeing uh, to move these two buildings forward into designation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crutch, you got a question? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, thanks for your presentation. My it's pleasure. It was informative. Um, and staff may have to answer some of these questions if, if later on. Um, but a couple things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, number one, from your perspective for 6660 Charlton Avenue, uh, what does the restoration landscape look like? So in terms of time, um, in terms of money, um, what does it look like in terms of restoring that building to uh, any kind of uh, condition that you would think would be adequate? Can I bring back the photos, please? Um, because the doors and windows are, are um, boarded up, I can't really see them that well. But brick, the brick is, is in beautiful. Here we go. Thank you. I'll just... <laughs> yes, that's probably, that's probably the best one. Um, I'm going to say something that I shouldn't hear. There are some people in restoration who are charging too much. There are a lot of people who are fully capable of doing restoration who could do this for a reasonable amount. The brick is in very good shape. Um, I can recommend a, a mason that could do some repointing if necessary. The fish scale shingles. Here and here. These are dead giveaways for the Queen Anne period. Um, those are also in good shape, which is not necessarily the case. There is a Queen Anne that is being restored on the main street of Wellington in Prince Edward County. Um, they had to redo most of those fish scale shingles and they're not actually that hard to do. These are in great shape. The windows are mostly um, new or replaced, so that's not a problem. I would think that these bands, um, which are quite large, uh, 
I honestly don't think it would be that difficult. Why I'm saying this and why I can speak with some authority, thank you very much, is um, I have rebuilt an old house myself and I have a, oh golly, 60 foot railing that is almost as intricate as um, that denticulated band and it was done in less than a week this summer by somebody who charged $20 an hour. I really don't think the exterior is going to cost a lot to restore at all. And I, can, I would certainly be able to um, suggest people to do it at a reasonable cost. There are some excellent people out there, absolutely excellent. And some of them charge a lot of money, some of them charge a lot less, and both are, are excellent. As far as the interior goes, um, I haven't actually seen the interior. I would assume as a Queen Anne that it has an incredible newel post by the, um, by the stairwell. And I would also assume that it has a couple of nice um, inlaid uh, bookcases like the Osler House does. Those could be maintained. The flooring is probably in excellent shape. It's Edwardian, so it would probably be between three inches and four inches wide. So not huge, so it wouldn't be all like the Georgian. Sometimes when you get a Georgian floor, you it's a lot of work, but the Edwardian is not necessarily that much work. Um, and the rest, as far as kitchens and, and bathrooms going in, in my opinion, and again, I'm sure that a lot of restoration types don't agree with me, but if you're looking at a 1900 building, you need a new bathroom. Call me crazy. You're not going to use the original. So as long as you've got that square footage, then, you know, Fill your boots, do whatever you want, put it in a shower. There's a place in Dundas on um, Harvest Road that they're putting imams in. Like, it's gonna be a spa. So imams with like a, a, a steam shower. It's gonna be incredible. And I think that's fine as long as the integrity of the building is maintained, the cornices, the baseboards. I don't, I don't think ex from the exterior, this is not a hard job at all. Let's look at the other one. No, it's, again, I don't know what the windows are like, but the brick's in pretty good shape. Be ha I would be happy to get quotes on this if it would be of any help. Probably not. I don't think we need to have you go to that extent, though. Okay. <laughs> your, your presentation's been excellent. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anything else? I did have one other question. If you do know the answer, if you don't, by all means, I'm happy to ask staff or do more research on my own time. Um, you talked about the inventory in the neighborhood and you talked about um, the Durand neighborhood being mainly intact. I mean, of course, um, after urban renewal, I think you're referring to, but um, you talked about, you know, there being not as many examples of this Edwardian architecture in the building, uh, sorry, in the neighborhood. Um, do you have a sense of sort of the inventory of the neighborhood and how this compares to other buildings? Um, how much of a scarcity uh, you're talking about here uh, in terms of the built heritage inventory? Um, it'd be good to understand if there's a way to quantify that in any, any meaningful, meaningful way. Well, um, most of these buildings, there were two or three large properties, Ravenscliff, um, for example, the castle, that were, um, mid 19th century and they had farmlands of course and they had stables and et cetera and there were all sorts of uh, little smaller workers cottages around which are fantastic. But there was a big push between 18, I'm gonna say 95 and 1910 to fill up this area with a higher level residential. There are a couple of, um, on Ravenscliff itself, there is a Queen Anne that is made out of the same type of brick. I believe it's right on the corner. Um, but it doesn't have the Edwardian elements. The rest are um, more Edwardian than Victorian, whereas this is definitely the Queen Anne Victorian style. Um, the ones down Bay Street are definitely Victorian, again, with the same beautiful brick. So in, in the neighborhood, there are quite a few that have the same materials, um, but not as many that have the mixture of the Victorian and the Edwardian. Okay. Anything else? That's great. Is there any other questions? Uh, oh, well, go ahead. Um, my question is, uh, the, the, the Osler House, I, I remember being on the board eight years ago or so, and we did something about it at that time, some plaque of some kind. Does anyone recall that? Um, I was just reading about it, and I believe that we gave it a, a, an award at that time. 
Um, like 2013, yeah. I think. Yes, I think I think you're right. I think I remember seeing it right by the front door. Yeah, I remember taking it out there and uh, being there that day. It's an absolutely stunning place. Absolutely. Um, and beautifully placed. You, can, you think it's, you know, very far from the city and it's only two blocks. And McMaster owns it today? McMaster owns it today and, and I'm sure they're going to do a great job and I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. I just want to make sure that they don't wreck the windows because there are an awful lot of semi-informed people who just go in and say, well, we need new windows. That's it. That's all. They do it. And they, they have no idea that what they're doing is is um, actually making something that's not going to last as long, that is less energy efficient and in the long run is more expensive and worse for the, for the climate. You know, I understand uh, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands was there. Yes, she was. And uh, yes, when it comes to any place in Hamilton that you could really have someone like that, this, this is, is the it. only place. Yeah. yeah, this is it. So that's another reason why it should be designated, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Karen, you have a question? Thank you. Just a clarification. So it's not a question. We will have an opportunity later in the meeting to discuss our next steps on these properties, correct? Exactly. Yeah, so we still have staff report. So. so I think you should maybe just ask McMaster if you can have lunch in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the dining room table is still there. Go, go for it. Yes. Will, before you speak, is there any other first time uh, questions from the other committee members? No. Go ahead. Go ahead, Will. Oh, okay. The, um, with McMaster, right now is it vacant or what's happened in the interim? Um, it, I'm not actually sure. Um, they just left on the 6th of November. So it was taken over by McMaster on the 7th. So that's only 10 days ago. I believe what they're going to be doing is doing some, you know, minor renovations on the inside, but everything's in perfectly good shape and they are, they are maintaining the heat. It's McMaster. They're going to do a good job. They're going to do it right. Let's just help them do it really right. And McMaster is using it for uh, what high-priced visiting doctors. I would imagine it's going to be for that sort of thing. Yeah, possibly running it as a as a bed and breakfast sort of thing for visiting professors or dignitary speakers, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure they'll do an excellent job. I just don't want them to be misguided by people who are, who don't have my opinions, which are clearly correct. <laughs> if there are no other questions or, or requests for clarification from our presenter, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation? I see Graham and I see Robin. And is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that item is received. Thank you very much, Shannon, for your presentation. And we'll now hear from Matt Johnson from Urban Solutions Planning and Development. Um, Matt is here representing the property owners and respecting the recommendation to designate 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue West in Hamilton. <laughs> Welcome, Matt. Uh, so just a reminder that you have five minutes for your delegation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of committee, staff, and the public. My name is Matt Johnston, a registered professional planner with Urban Solutions here in Hamilton. And I'm here on behalf of the owner uh, Ms. Angie Neshi, who joins us virtually. And um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, you know, one of the issues that, that ultimately led to where we are today is, is the buildings themselves. And, and what started this track was the inability to continue leasing the space for the commercial uses. It's historically been dental and, and medical uses within this building. And as these leases came up for renewal, there was little to no interest to, to continue on or to attract um, new tenants to lease because the buildings are not um, not accessible. Uh, there's no elevators. Um, you know, so there, there, that was really the, the impetus to the, the downfall of these buildings. We heard from the previous speaker that up to a year ago, um, they were in much better condition. And it was sort of the, the slow inability to, to renew or find new tenants to lease to that, uh, that led to this decision um, to, to pursue demolition. One of the things I think we've, we've learned, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking to those who already understand, but I do think that the, the process, what I've learned is, is really flawed. 
Um, what we have here is someone who has spent uh, upwards of 60,000 in pursuing all the necessary disconnects, um, disconnecting hydro, disconnecting gas, uh, doing road cuts to cap the sewers in at the main line. It's not just capped, it's not just a disconnect where the line meets the house. We actually had to go out into the municipal right of way and, and cap it at that location. So um, it, it's a little bit concerning. And like I said, I'm sure many of you understand this already, but um, this path towards the demolition permit has been ongoing for quite some time. And, you know, I read the staff report and get concerned when I, I see that heritage staff um, started to, to get nervous about this building um, earlier, much earlier this year, yet we continued on this path and, and um, now the owners sort of landed on, on the agenda today. So um, what we would like to do is, is work with staff on what, what we typically call a documentation and salvage report, where we sort of work to balance uh, provincial objectives. We, we know the objective to, to maintain our, our heritage building stock, but we also know other good municipal objectives in terms of providing good quality, affordable infill housing. And, and that's the direction that the owner would like to go in here is to accommodate a redevelopment, improve the municipal tax base, bring on some, some great new units. We're talking about 10 to 12 in a new build. Uh, and what the documentation and salvage report would allow is an opportunity to secure and, and by secure, I mean, you know, financially secure the retention of some of those features. There's the, the stone masonry wall uh, along the park. Um, there's elements of the building that we heard from earlier um, from the previous speaker who articulated some of those, uh, some of those features. So what we do is a, a documentation salvage report that allows some of those to be reincorporated into a, a redevelopment. There were also questions about the quality and, and the unknown interior. And as I mentioned, um, these have acted as uh, dental and medical offices for, uh, for, for a number of years. And, and in doing so, the, the interior has all been totally renovated, totally um, renovated to accommodate small medical offices, um, meaning that there's not a lot of those original features um, that, uh, that would warrant protection on the interior. Uh, so that's, um, that's the state of, of the inside, the, the outside, um, you know, we know the buildings were joined. Um, we know uh, some of the features that were earlier spoken to, and that's what we'd like to really uh, look at incorporating through a documentation salvage report. Um, so with that, that would be, that would be my ask uh, today is that we pursue that as an alternative to, to designation. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, and just, just a reminder, the question should be in regards to the delegation's presentation. Will we still have the staff report coming forward? Uh, we also have Graham to add to the speaker's list. Are there any other uh, members that would like to ask questions? We'll get you added to that speaker's list. Right. Go ahead, Janice. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Matt, uh, for joining us today um, on behalf of uh, the owner. Um, you mentioned uh, the stone masonry wall, um, and I, I, I can tell you, I, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, but that wall uh, is no longer, I'd say a good portion of it has been destroyed. And I, my concern is, did it happen during uh, having to cut into the road, disconnect the water, et cetera, et cetera. And along with that concern, and I guess what alerted everyone to the situation was this property is on the Duran Built Heritage Inventory, and it does require, because it is it is on the register, it does require uh, 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 an opportunity for 60 days notice. Well, the, it appears that that excavation permit, they did not go through the proper channels. So that's how many of us got alerted to that. And we were alerted to those things, uh, including uh, the vandalism and uh, the drug users and breaking in into the place, creating problems for the neighbors on the street. So it was the neighborhood that alerted um, us to the issues with that property, including the stone wall that is crumbled and should be repaired. Thank you. If I may respond through the chair, just um, you know, one point of clarification in terms of proper channels. Um, 
prior to being able to apply for the demolition permit that that initiates the 60 day um, the 60 day clock for the lack of a better word um, the requirement is that all of those disconnects hydro gas sanitary water etc be done in advance of the demolition permit so I, I just wanted to touch on that 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 we weren't really doing anything out of sequence um, you know in fact we were we were going through the regular channels um, in advance of being able to make that application so it, it wasn't that that we did any uh, any missteps or, or or did anything out of sequence so when when someone goes to pursue a demolition permit you can't just apply on day one and, and drop off the demolition permit that the you you must bring the confirmation from all of the utilities you must actually disconnect all of those services before you're even allowed to apply for that demolition permit. So that's what was happening over the last number of months. Um, and, and that's where I think I, I, I'd highlight that the, the process is flawed and that someone can actually go through those channels, um, pursuing all of those disconnects in advance of applying for the demolition permit, only to find out now that that, that money uh, that uh, may have been spent um, and, and now go and undo all that work and, and have to reconnect. Um, so I, I think if, if there's a take home for all of us here, it might be one that we could uh, look at that process to, to ensure that owners don't get this far down the road, um, you know, spending this, this type of money, sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollars in pursuing all of these requirements uh, that you must do in advance of a disconnect, uh, in advance of a permit application. So uh, again, that would be my, my take home and it was just really a, a point of clarity that uh, there was nothing done out of sequence or, or improperly. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, if I could just, um, sorry. Uh, it's th uh, I'm sorry, Alyssa, through the chair. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I, I can tell you that what you just said to me, um, I that's news to me. I Maybe I'm misreading things and, and maybe staff could help out with that point because I, uh, that, Going, going through and getting all that done, and then going to us after is—I um, don't know. I, I need, I need somebody else to tell me that. Thank you. Um, maybe if I can just step in. And, and Matt, was the property owner not aware that their property was on the register? And did they, did they go to staff for pre-consultation before they were processing a building permit? Um. The, the, there was no pre-consultation done prior to the permit. They essentially handed this over to the demolition contractor, Landmark Environmental, who are certainly well-versed in, in pursuing demolitions. And um, that that process and that sequence is, is my understanding of, of the protocol uh, as relayed to me by, uh, by the demolition consultant. So, and, and it's in keeping with my, my general understanding that it, it wasn't news to me that uh, that was the appropriate channel to uh, pursue a demolition. I, I actually worked concurrently on another property with the same um, uh, the same demolition consultant, and um, they did the exact same process, pursue all of those disconnects, and only then can you apply for the demolition permit. But uh, happy to let staff clarify. Thank you. While we're on this topic, would staff like to comment? Sure, through the chair, Alyssa Golden, Senior Project Manager of Heritage and Urban Design. Um, I've actually just reached out to my colleagues in building just to confirm because that wasn't the impression that we'd had, although we are not the experts in terms of the building permit process. I will note, however, that um, the Ontario Heritage Act requirements in terms of giving notice of intention to demolish a listed property is separate from the building permit process. Um, so yes, certainly something that we can follow up with our colleagues in building in terms of confirming. Um, I wasn't under the impression that you had to have um, those disconnection services done at the time of the demolition permit application. Uh, I've been circulated in the past in my previous role as heritage planner um, uh, regarding disconnection of services after a building permit has been applied for. So certainly something we can look to clarify um, and, and see if there's potentially a gap that we can look at improving moving forward as well. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, Janice, was there any further question? If not, we'll move on to Graham. Graham, you're next. Hey, everyone else, thank you for coming along, Matt. We appreciate it. Uh, but when it comes to this property, 
we like these intact neighborhoods and we know what's there and the proper owner should have been aware he's on the, they were on the registry so they could have gone through some proper steps but you're saying about the interior being kind of gutted and made into small rooms and stuff for an office is, to me that's an opportunity for the property owner because they don't have to worry about heritage features now to change walls around and make it into a nice condo building and like a lot of other buildings have been successfully added on to to make it financially viable to convert it to residential i think this is an opportunity shouldn't look at it as a, a thing just to tear down the building and start over in the time of climate change there's a lot of trapped carbon in that building already paid for let's save it let's help the environment not fill up our landfills there's a lot of good reasons for keeping that building intact and i think it should be Thank you. Councilor Critch. Oh, hi, Matt. Um, thanks for your presentation. I had a couple of questions for you based on uh, the comments you, you made about uh, frustration from the owner. Um, so based on what you've said, am I here, if I'm hearing you correctly, I think what you're saying is that when it's a heritage property, first of all, there should be a different, a slightly different process. Because I think if, if I'm tagging onto what Janice says here, um, you know, when someone knows it's a heritage property, um, applying for a demolition permit, even if you're permitted to apply for a demolition permit, um, in itself may be something to think about. Uh, maybe first wise to um, go through the heritage process first. Um, and then the second thing you said was about, you know, this approval happening, the approval process happening, all these things being disconnected, people spending tons of money, which makes sense. And then um, being having to go through this process in the second on the second part. So my question to you is like, do you think that an a, improvement to the process would be uh, having um, a demolition permit approved and then beginning this work? Uh, you know, in, in that sequence, you just said a demolition through the chair, um, a demolition permit being approved and then going through this work. Um, I, I do. I, I think that, um, and again, it's it's truly my understanding. It's it's similar with with other. We don't do demolition, but I, occasionally we we see it happening in our circles, and and that's just my general understanding is that you must do all of that legwork, all of those disconnects before you're allowed to apply. And if if you were able to apply uh, without doing all of those works um, and land in front of planning committee before all of that energy and and money was spent. Uh, that would certainly be uh, an improvement to the process. Thanks for that. Yeah, I tend to agree but simply because uh, through the chair, this pressure of doing these um, developments, sorry, these improvements or whatever you want to call them, disconnects, pardon me, the, pr the process of doing those disconnects puts the pro property under pressure. And if for some reason you weren't allowed to demolish the property, um, it seems like work that could be, uh, you know, counter to the building's continued health. And um, mm -hmm. we've seen that several times in the Duran neighborhood. Uh, my second question for you is if you could actually speak to what original features remain. Um, you had access to the building and I know that uh, the previous delegate had spoken about um, some, you know, charming staircase features that may exist and these kinds of things. To the extent that you can recall, what features do you think uh, do remain that stood out to you from the interior? Thank you uh, for the good question. I have not been in the building, but I'm advised that there are no real original features. Um, there, I'm, I'm told there's that the flooring has been all replaced, uh, banisters. Um, there, there are no similar bookshelves and, and encasings like we saw in the uh, the home in Dundas. Um, but again, I haven't been in, but I, I'm just going by what I've been told. So. That's that's what led us to, to consider the documentation and salvage report as a another viable option because there there are features in the interior uh, to be preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of our committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much, Matt. We really appreciate you uh, providing a delegation today for the on behalf of the property owner. Thank you. May I have a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation? I see Graham and I see Karen. Okay, is there anyone opposed to receiving the delegation? 
Seeing none, that item is carried. Um, so ju just as clarification, you can remain in the, the meeting while we um, discuss the rest of the, the property um, and through the staff presentations and the reports. Just while we're on this, I, uh, Madam Clerk, one of the items that came out of this was just getting uh, staff clarification in regards to the process. Um, I believe disconnects are part of the condition of building permit, but not required prior to. Um, so do you need a motion to ask staff to? No, okay. Um, so we'll just minute that. And we'll move on to our staff presentations. Uh, Lisa, Chris, so in regards to recommendation to designate 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue West in Hamilton under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act, um, Lisa Christie is here with a presentation and staff report. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, just give me a second while I pull it up, please. Hi, so good morning. Um, thanks for being here today. My name is Lisa, and I'm presenting the staff report PED 22208, which recommends the property at 66 and 68 Charlton um, Avenue West be designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, so this property is located on the corner of Park and Charlton in the Duran neighborhood. Um, it was originally constructed as two single detached, two and a half story dwelling, brick dwellings. Um, it's now connected with central two story addition. Uh, so just to provide some context, um, some recent history of the property. So City Hamilton listed the property on the register in 2017, and the building has since been on our radar. Early in the year, we received complaints about the vacant status of the property, and in February, it was added to the vacant building. Uh, register and um, the owner has since applied for a variety of building permits including an excavation permit for the re removal of utilities and two building permit applications for the demolition of 66 and 68 Charlton Avenue West uh, which prompted staff to develop this report which is being presented today all right uh, so in preparation for this report I conducted a site visit from the public right away and Megan or Meg Oldfield our heritage intern researched the property and compiled materials uh, which informed the historic context of this report. Um, and then we tested the property against the criteria for determining cultural heritage value or interest as prescribed in Ontario Regulation 906. Um, and we determined that the property meets seven of the nine criteria uh, in Ontario Regulation 906. So this property is representative of Queen Anne Revival style architecture through its two and a half story brick construction tall hip roofs punctuated with a variety of dormers, bays, and chimneys, and the use of variety of materials and textures. Um, and this property also displays a high degree of craftsmanship and artistic merit. Um, this property illustrates the theme of wealth and development in early 20th century Hamilton, and the property yields an understanding of domestic tastes of affluent ha Hamiltonians at the turn of the century. And this property also reflects the work and ideas of, of prominent architects F.J. Rastrick and Sons, who are significant to the Hamilton community. Uh, so pictured on the right are works completed by the firm F.J. Rastrick and Sons between 1905 and 1913. Uh, you may recognize the 20th Century Club, des it, which is a designated property on Lock Street, and the Stony Creek Battlefield Monument, which is a National Historic Site of Canada. Sorry. Uh, so the property is considered important in supporting the character of Duran neighborhood and the property is physically, historically, and visually linked to its surroundings. Uh, so this is a summary of the statement of cultural heritage value or interest. The property located at 66 and 68 Charlton Avenue West is comprised of two formerly single detached two and a half brick story, uh, two and a half story brick dwellings. The design of the buildings is representative of earlier of early 20th century Queen Anne Revival style architecture and demonstrates a high degree of artistic merit and craftsmanship. Uh, the property at 68 Charlton Avenue West is attributed to F.J. Rastrick and Sons and is one of the few surviving buildings designed by the two sons of the noted Her Hamilton ar architect, Frederick James Rastrick. The property at 66 and 68 Charlton Avenue West supports the historic character of the Durand neighborhood. And the property defines the northeast corner of Charlton Avenue West and Park Street with two elevations featuring notable architectural details, a moderate setback, and a large stone wall along the west boundary of Park Street. Uh, so important to the conservation of 66 Charlton Avenue West are the front and side elevations all and all historic elements and decorative details present on these elevations, as well as the moderate setback from Charlton Avenue West. 
And important to the conservation of 68 Charlton Avenue West are the front and side elevations. All historic elements and decorative details present on these elevations. The stone perimeter wall on the west property line and the moderate setback from Charlton Avenue West and Park Street South. And thanks for your time and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, if we could start a speaker's list, uh, is there any members uh, virtually? Yep. Okay, Councilor Pat. Go ahead, Councilor. Thanks for your presentation, I really appreciate it. Can we go back to slide three? Um, I need another second on that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, great. It looks like if I'm reading this correctly, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. This property was listed on the Municipal Heritage Register in June 2017. It doesn't say, and I'd be curious to know when ownership transferred. So um, there's a current owner. Uh, I'd be curious to know when the current owner bought the property. Um, I do see here that um, the notice was sent to the owner of the listed property status and OHA requirements in September. Um, but I'm wondering when they purchased it and how that relates to this timeline. Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, we can take a look to see if we have confirmation of that. We, uh, in preparation of the staff report, did do a title search. I'm not sure, sure if that's something that, if it's possible to, if the owners are on the lines and able to answer that as well. Um, but at this point, I don't have the answer to that, but we can look into it. Okay, fair enough. Um, oh, sorry, there's Matt, I see. Good morning, Madam Chair. If you'd like, I could provide clarity on timing of ownership. Oh, that would be great. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. It was uh, acquired in 2005. I don't have a definitive date offhand, but it was the year 2005. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now I have a, a follow-up question <laughs> based on that. So it's in my understanding based on everything people said today that A, um, the current owners were those who were leasing medical and dental facilities to individuals who were occupied in the building um, and would have also been present or cognizant of the property being listed on the Municipal Heritage Register in 2017 as I'm assuming that the ownership didn't break during that time. So if I understand that correctly, is it reasonable to suggest that there have been at least a couple of occasions um, where the owner has been made aware that this um, item is listed on the Municipal Heritage Register? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. As far as we know, the owner has been the same since then. Um, so any notification of the addition to the Re Municipal Heritage Register and the notice that was sent in September would have gone to that owner. Mm -hmm. Thank you, those are my questions. Go ahead, Janice. Um, I don't need to um, ask my question because that is exactly what I was going to point out. Um, and uh, yes, so that, that's been cleared up. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Are there any other questions? If there's no other questions uh, regarding the presentation, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation? I see Councillor Crutch and I see Janice. And is there anyone opposed to receiving the presentation? That item is carried. We'll now move on to the report. Are there any questions in regards to the report that's before us? Which does contain the recommendation to designate 66 to 68 Charlton Avenue West. <coughs> any questions of that report? Seeing none, may I have a mover and a seconder to um, approve the recommendations as noted in the report? I see Janice and I see Graham. <clears throat> and is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that item is carried. Thank you, everyone. We now move on to our next item, which is the Heritage Permit Application HP 2022-026, under Section 33 of the Ontario Heritage Act, for the removal of the contemporary rear addition, construction of a new rear addition, and rehabilitation of the Pinehurst Building at 163 Jackson Street West in Hamilton. Uh, Chloe Richer is here with a presentation and staff report. Welcome, Chloe. 
Good morning, Madam Chair. Just a moment, I will pull up my presentation on screen. My apologies, uh, Madam Chair and members. I will just uh, pull up my presentation on the screen. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee. Uh, as noted by our chair, I am Chloe Richet, Cultural Heritage Planner with Heritage and Urban Design. Thank you for your attention as I present to you regarding uh, Heritage Permit Application HP 2022-026 for a Part 4 designated property to permit the removal of the contemporary rear addition, construction of a new rear addition, and the rehabilitation of the Pinehurst Building at 163 Jackson Street West, Hamilton in Ward 2. Uh, before jumping into my next slide, I'll just note there was a minor error in the staff report on page 10. The windows are to be retained, not replaced, and uh, that corresponds with section 4.5 of the conservation plan. Thank you. Uh, so to begin, this slide simply contains a location map of the Part 4 designated property on Jackson Street West at Caroline Street South. I also wanted to share key background information on the designation of the property. The original portion of the Pinehurst building was constructed in the 1850s and designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act by Municipal Bylaw 03-052. The reasons for designation apply to all elevations, the mansard roof, all facades, entranceway, porches, windows, and chimneys, and the construction materials and building techniques. Please note that the existing contemporary rear addition is not included in the reasons for designation. In this slide are simply uh, several images of the property captured uh, last month in October 2022 showing the Pinehurst building and the contemporary rear addition. I'll now go over some key information related to the Planning Act and heritage permit applications for the property. In 2017, the applicant submitted applications for Urban Hamilton Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendments, which were subsequently appealed to, uh, at the time, the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, or LPAT, the February 2020 LPAT decision allowed the appeal, and as such, a site plan control application to implement this decision was submitted in July 2020. It received conditional approval from the city on November 5th, 2021. The subject heritage permit application was received in September of this year and went before the Heritage Permit Review Subcommittee on September 13th. Conditional approval was recommended by the subcommittee. The application was discussed by Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee uh, at their September 15th meeting, and the committee recommended that the application be undelegated and further reviewed by HMHC. Revised submission materials were received earlier this month, and they consisted of a revised cultural heritage impact assessment, a revised uh, documentation and salvage report, a revised conservation plan, which is the key study uh, that was analyzed in the staff report, as well as a revised interpretation plan. I'll now provide a high level overview of the three aspects of the scope of work. The first aspect is the removal of the contemporary circa 1980s rear addition. So in addition to the demolition, there will be interim repair and security measures, as well as an interim office use in the Pinehurst building during construction, uh, which is a positive change from the previous plan to mothball the building. The second aspect of the scope of work is the construction of a new two-story glazed rear addition. Below you can see a photograph of the existing addition and an elevation of the Pinehurst building with the proposed glazed addition. Finally, the third aspect to be considered is the fulsome rehabilitation of the Pinehurst building. Uh, the repairs to various heritage features are listed below. Cultural Heritage staff, the Heritage Permit Review Subcommittee, and HMHC had all previously identified some key concerns that needed to be addressed by the applicant. 
I've indicated below how the conservation plan has addressed concerns about the protection of the Pinehurst building during demolition and new construction, such as through oversight by an experienced heritage contractor and by vibration monitoring. In addition, staff have recommended key conditions of approval for the heritage permit application that will need to be cleared, such as providing financial securities for the work. Other concerns identified that have been addressed in the conservation plan and through the recommended conditions of approval include interim monitoring and security, though again, I'll highlight uh, the new approach to have the building occupied uh, during construction. The proposed addition to Pinehurst, as well as the rehabilitation of the Pinehurst building, which is to follow best conservation practices identified in both relevant city policies, as well as the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada. As such, staff are recommending approval of HP 2022-026, subject to the conditions below. Um, I won't go through all of these as I'm uh, just about wrapping up my time on the presentation. I'll also note that staff are recommending that the director of planning and chief planner has the authority to execute the agreements necessary to satisfy uh, the heritage permit conditions. I'd like to thank the members uh, for your time. I'll welcome any questions, and I'd also note the applicant and team are also um, in attendance should they wish to speak to any questions or concerns noted by members. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um, do we have any questions in regards to the presentation? Janice. Janice. Is there any other member that would like to be added to the speakers list while we're up? Go ahead, Janice. Um, through the chair, Chloe, would you kindly put up uh, the recommendations? I, you, you said that you weren't going to go through all of them. Well, you flipped them very quickly, and I'd just like to have those up while I'm speaking, if you don't mind. I think it's the second to last slide, or third to last slide. Through the chair, thank you. Um, I do have them in full as well, so I could actually flip to that if preferred, but I'll start with the summary yeah, start and with that uh, one. take it from there. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I do, now, are there other people on this speaker's list? Because I have several questions, and um, I, I can certainly stand in line, answer one, and go back. I can stand in line again. It's up to the chair. At, at this time, you're the only uh, speaker. Oh, so okay, go, go ahead and thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just highlighted um, a few things. And um, at some time, and I don't know when that will be the right time, I would like to really address some of the concerns that the Duran Neighborhood Association issued. Several, there have been some terrific changes, and I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. And one thing that I'd like to say, um, when this all started, I... <laughs> As you know, I do not read well on the computer, so I tend to print a lot of material. And I had the conservation plan and the heritage impact assessment from August. So when we were doing our homework, um, that's what I was looking at. And then um, there was a second co a revised conservation plan and a heritage impact assessment following a uh, uh, permit review meeting and following the uh, Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee meeting, where we asked if we could bring this file to Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee without delegated authority. So I uh, really appreciate the work that's been done, but I, I got those files on Wednesday. And uh, between what I had read before and all of the changes, um, I'm all over the place. So I really will apologize, but I have been working on this um, over the weekend and, and, and have read it and reread it. So I hope I'm going to be, I hope I'm not going to appear too stupid as I go through these things. Um, with the staff report, the recommendation, um, Chloe, if, if, through the chair, Chloe, I just want to know, um, I, under recommendation A, item one, the last statement, prior to the issuance of a final occupancy permit. Is that the permit for the uh, office that's going to be there while construction is going on, or is that the final, what we're going to see, whatever use uh, Pinehurst ends up being? Uh, 
through the chair, Alyssa Golden, responding uh, to the member. Um, yes, so th that condition is worded so that all of the uh, required conservation works that Chloe had highlighted in the third scope of work, that those all be completed prior to the final occupancy of the final use of Piners. So not intended for the temporary use, recognizing that a lot of the um, required conservation works, masonry restoration, other things, most likely will be done as a part of the final works before occupancy of the new use of the building. Okay, that, I appreciate that because I read that a couple times. Um, okay, now I'm going over to uh, the report. Oh my goodness. Uh, so it's, it's uh, condition number three, and it has to do with the financial uh, instrument uh, for the security as, uh, as it applies to item number one. Um, which is uh, the estimate for 100% of the total cost, securing, protecting, stabilizing the retained forests, cost of monitoring and security for four years, because we know nothing is going to happen for four years, and the co total cost of restoration. I am totally unfamiliar with just exactly uh, and how much this financial inst uh, instrument might be. Uh, if it is not significant enough, it is. It certainly has no teeth. So I have concern about that. Um, I, I, and that I know has to be worked out before the permit is uh, allowed. Is that correct? Through the chair to staff. Through you, Madam Chair, Ken Coit, Manager of Heritage and Urban Design. Um, yes, that does have to be worked out with staff. We expect uh, appropriate professionals to be giving us meaningful uh, and well thought out costing for the scope of work that's in the conservation plan. Uh, this is a typical thing that happens in development approvals and uh, the city is not, it's not unusual to have these uh, in the million dollar range or higher. Um, to cover these issues. Okay. <laughs> it's that much is at least needed as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, I'm now in um, item number two, 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 four, and it's about the monitoring reports. And I read through, I've got the, cons I've got the conservation um, summary uh, with the monitoring frequency. And um, I... I have some, I, I may be reading it incorrectly, but when I looked at immediate action to be taken, so you've got their conservation plan, monitoring frequency, the objective maintenance checklist, and it just says log observations, repairs, provide report to the owner and repair as required. So two questions with regard, and that goes all the way down for all of them. It doesn't say anything about city staff in the conservation report. Will this be going to city staff? And my other concern through the chair to whomever would like to answer, repair, repair, that is, is that just repair, so it's just okay, but it's not done according to the standards and guidelines, because this is just a monitoring. From what I can understand, there is this re rehabilitation isn't even going to happen until, until the building is built, is starting to get built, and there'll be an excavation, da, 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 whatever. So there is no rehabil rehabilitation conservation going on for four years. That's my understanding. Through staff, can you um, answer those three questions? What does repair mean, and is it going to city staff? And am I right in assuming that there is no rehabilitation um, as outlined in the conservation plan uh, until four years from now? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, to answer uh, the first part of the question, staff would expect to see the monitoring reports as well. Um, it may say to the owner, but uh, we would expect to see those, and that has been outlined in the recommended staff conditions of approval as well. Um, in terms of repairs, we would be looking for the repairs to meet the city's property standard bylaws. Um, I understand what you're saying about you know the full rehabilitation not taking place until later on, but that would be one key uh, policy tool that we would have and look at the property standards bylaw. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, that of course upsets me. But going on, um, I'm, I'm in the executive summary and it has to do with 
something that says conditionally, I'm in the last sentence, conditionally approved site plan control applications. So I question uh, through, this, through the chair to appropriate staff, I would like to know how many outstanding conditions there are. I've tried asking this question on numerous occasions and I'm not really getting an answer. Through you, Madam Chair, Ken Coit, Manager of Heritage and Urban Design. Um, I also oversee site plans. Um, there are many numerous um, conditions on the site plan for this site that aren't related to heritage, but there are three specific um, that the owner submit and receive approval of conditional of a conservation plan satisfaction to the satisfaction of myself that the owner submit and receive approval of the heritage permit for the implementation of the measures outlined in the conservation plan, which is what we are talking about today. Again, to the satisfaction of the manager of development planning, heritage and urban design. And finally, that the owner submit and receive approval of a documentation salvage report for the portions of the CHCH studio building to be demolished to the satisfaction of myself. It will be noted that all of the various uh, conditions on this heritage permit would have to be satisfied before um, item 11 could be satisfied to clear site plan. So in order you, to clear, a uh, site plan needs to be cleared before a permit can be um, provided uh, for any construction. Uh, I would also like to point out we do um, uh, hear what the DNA uh, Durant Neighborhood Association noted about trying to minimize the time that uh, the site would be empty, if at all, if the demolition <laughs> were to occur. So um, we have structured this um, conditional approval to be a concurrent one where the applicant can actually be working to clear their heritage permit conditions, clear their site plan conditions, and be, and be having their permits reviewed at the same time so that hopefully um, at some point in uh, early 2023, uh, all permits will be ready uh, at approximately the same time to avoid any time that the site would remain um, not active. Uh, through the chair to Ken, thank you very much for that. And I'm, I'm, I, I do know that you obviously read uh, the DNA's concern. And uh, just a comment, and um, maybe uh, Councillor uh, Kretsch will also uh, take this into consideration. Um, this is in in many municipalities before they even allow a, a permit all conditions have to be met. So this is, I don't know if this is unusual to Hamilton or are there are others that do this. I can't go there, I don't know enough about it, but I just like would like to express that's a concern of Durand, it's a concern of mine as well. And I think my last, uh, no, not my last question, um, new, the new glazed addition, since this permit now contains three things, it, it contains, um, when is that new glazed addition gonna happen? through the chair to somebody. We're, we're just we're just getting some clarification as to who's going to respond to that through, question, Janice. Okay. Through the chair, Ken Coit, Manager Heritage and Urban Design. I'm looking back at the applicant behind me. They're saying during the restoration of Pinehurst, so it will happen uh, uh, when they start the restoration of the building. Uh, of so course, that's the building four years down. Okay. About that. All right, now my last thing, and it has to do, I think this is my last thing, it has to do with deterioration of Pinehurst um, over the, quite possibly over the next four years, regardless of the monitoring. Um, so as I read through, um, the new report now basically says that Pinehurst is anywhere from um, fair. Uh, fair to good, we don't have as many poor uh, conditions. But the ones that I noticed um, under poor, uh, oh, da, 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 here we go, conditions. Da, da, da. Okay, page 13, uh, vine growth. Um, I have reported that vine growth through the Duran Neighborhood Association uh, several times. We know it is persistent, we know it is harmful, and it is listed as poor. Why? Couldn't that be looked after? Yes, it is a condition of the conservation plan, but why do we have to wait for four years? Uh, page 18, the windows, they talk about the windows. The sealants apparently are very poor. We know what moisture does 
to heritage buildings if they're not maintained. Page 20, 4.7, flat roof, which it was built in 1875. I'm sure it's been repaired several times. The condition is poor. Flat roofs are notorious for water damage. Page 21, 22, 4.8, slate, fair to poor. And what happens to the second and third floors because they're not uh, going to be occupied? Will there be interior checks to determine whether or not we've got damage? And I don't think I saw anything about inter interior. And number, page 23, 4.9, roof and parapet flashing. Can these survive with Un, without undue water damage because they are also in poor and most and also concerning 4.10 page 24 drainage and that's a concern so i i don't understand why how we're going to maintain this building over four years when we've got five or six items that are listed as poor condition and finally um fencing I understand it's only around Pinehurst. What can we expect of the rest of the property? Or we will we be subject to Char, uh, to Jackson Street West and James Street South, uh, James Street Baptist? Or I can go back even further than that. Will we be uh, subject to Maine and John on the uh, south uh, east corner? Those are my concerns, questions. Through the chair, if somebody could speak to that. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, I'd just like to remind everybody that um, the uh, Ken Coit here, Manager of Heritage and Urban Design, that Pinehurst is to be um, used throughout the construction period, so it will be heated, it will be inhabited, which is a, a large improvement over what's happened in other locations. And with that, um, we have the applicant here. Um, I don't know, if, Madam Chair, there was a fair number of questions there. Um, I will turn it over to the applicant to see if they can answer some of them. Uh, thank you. Sharon Vite from Goldsmith Borgel and Company. We're the heritage consultant working for the uh, applicant. And on the uh, Zoom call, or whatever uh, system you have, uh, is my colleague Car Carlos Morel. He's the conservation architect with GBCA, so he can jump in with any technical question, um, answering any technical questions uh, as well. Um, I can just um, address through the chair to the uh, committee members' uh, questions um, in, in a high level. The conservation plan that you've received does have the monitoring uh, schedule and the uh, action to be taken. The idea being that the building will virtually be a functioning building as with any building that is currently owned and occupied by a private citizen who has uh, is occupying a designated building. So there are requirements just under building standards to maintain a uh, building. So the monitoring schedule, which uh, we, as you, as you commented on, as the member commented on, in our report, we don't uh, say that uh, we say that a log needs to be kept. Uh, the staff have now included as a condition of that, as a condition of approval, that that log be provided to them so that there's always an oversight by the city that the owner is maintaining what we as the heritage consultants have defined as the most important things to uh, conserve a building uh, in its current uh, condition. Now, the comment about the um, earlier, uh, earlier in the report, the condition review is typical of what we do for a um, before we develop a conservation strategy to look at the condition. So, wherever there were highlights that things are poor, there is an action of a long-term conservation strategy as part of the redevelopment once the owner gets to the point of uh, uh, the 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 uh, ultimate design of the uh, of the site, including the restoration of the house. But it doesn't preclude that those items will be considered under the monitoring and repair 
strategy early on. So, for example, and again, I've, uh, there was a long list that the, the member has pre presented, but for example, uh, drainage. So, yes, in the long-term conservation strategy in the earlier part of the report, we have defined the proper conservation method of installing the new uh, drain spouts. In the interim, in the years leading up to putting on the final uh, drainage system, the drainage is covered in the monitoring um, uh, section, whereby just like anybody who owns a, a, a home, they need to make sure that those things are repaired. And again, these repairs will be monitored through your city staff as they uh, have to approve any um, alterations or repairs to a, a building through, through the... Um, uh, through the process of monitoring the designated property. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into each item. Uh, Janice may have to no. <laughs> repeat them uh, so that I can address each one. And then, uh, as I say, Carlos Morel is on the line if there's anything that he could uh, add. Uh, no, through the chair, thank you very much. I do appreciate that because I basically said uh, the monitoring report um, I, and I was looking at repairs and I was looking at the fact that city staff, um, we wanted that report there. So I do appreciate that. And uh, I do appreciate your comments with regard to interim. And um, if, for me, having been through this a number of times, I can tell you that the monitoring and reporting is critical if this building is to survive over the next four years. And with with, and I, I, that's all I have to say about that. One last thing that I did ask about was the fencing. The fencing for the rest of the property, the property goes uh, from Hunter, Caroline to Jackson. That's a large uh, area. And I do know that the building itself will be fenced off Pinehurst, but I don't know what's happening to the rest once the 1983 uh, studio comes down. Through you, Madam Chair, um, the applicant will be required as a condition of site plan to prepare a uh, showing plan um, uh, and other documents for city approval for um, how the site will be secured, any road closures, um, to city standards. Um, so that will occur through the site plan process. I know, I, I, Sharon, I don't know if you can speak if there's any specific fencing for Pinehurst itself, as it will remain occupied and accessible. Uh, yes, through the chair, I can um, confirm that we do have a plan in the uh, document that shows the fencing around the house itself. That was um, that's primarily our concern in, in preparing this documentation for you for as part of this uh, submission. So within the conservation plan, we included a um, a plan that was prepared by the uh, owners, committed to by the owners, to put the fence around the designated portion. Of uh, or the, 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 the building, which is the, the key character defining feature of this designated property. Um, and then we did not consider the um, fencing of the rest of the site because we know that that is part of the overall uh, site plan process. And that's not in our purview in terms of heritage. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you, Janice. Uh, through the chair, I was just going to note in the set of drawings, Janice, if you have it open or if it would be helpful for me to pull it up, it's um, A-2.4, which is the ground floor plan. It does have a note yeah. about proposed fence around Heritage House during demolition, but you can see it uh, goes further around the property. I, I've got A-2.4. Oh, this says third floor. Just <laughs> eight point two ground floor. So, what am I looking at, Chloe? I don't know what I'm looking uh, at. Through the chair, Janice. It's in the appendix, and I'm just trying oh. to pull it up on my end. Um, but it's the drawing title is a dash two point four ground floor plan. So, oh, if you okay. give me a moment, I'll yeah. pull that up. I, okay. I wonder if no these drawings. I've got eight. 
Okay, you you pull it up and you show me because I curtain wall. I think I've got the right drawings. <laughs> I'm missing something, obviously. It's okay, Jana. Chloe's going to bring up the, the graphic. Through the chair, and it should be the first page in Appendix 3 of, um, sorry, to be too confusing. So the staff report, Appendix E, is the conservation plan, and yep. Appendix 3 of that conservation plan is what Chloe's pulling up right now. Oh, okay. I. See, I don't think I have that. It's okay as long as I can see it. Oh, there, see, I don't, I don't have that. It's interesting. Then again, my numbers are all screwy because I, oh, I print. If I can just interrupt for one moment, uh, it's Lorraine Kohler, Legislative Coordinator. Uh, we did have several issues with the size of the agenda for the meeting. Everything is available electronically. I believe one, uh, I believe it was uh, appendix, C, appendix C of this report, we were not even able to, to print it given the um, graphic heavy nature of the document. So it is all, it is all on the website, but yeah. unfortunately if you are printing it, yeah. uh, you're a brave woman. But uh, no, I, I didn't print not it. Not all of it had printed out. I had impressive printed for me, so I obviously I do not have that. Thank you. That's that's good to see. <laughs> okay, uh, so next with questions or, or comments is Councillor Crutch. Thanks very much. Uh, through the chair, I had a few questions. I'll start where Janice ended, just because I feel like that will be easiest for everyone for continuity purposes. Um, I looked at the drawing of the sidewalk, uh, fencing, pardon me, I should say, and it appears based on the drawing, uh, what do I know, but it appears based on the drawing that the fencing will not abut the sidewalk. Uh, it looks like it's going to be back from the tree line on one part. I'm curious about this because this is um, a very walkable neighborhood. Uh, there are many, many, many folks who use mobility devices in the neighborhoods. So I'm curious about um, maintaining the sidewalks around this property for everybody to use, um, which uh, from my personal observations is not the city's standard in all situations. So I want to understand how that will be, that will be done uh, over the next four years because I know that will be a big concern to folks in the neighborhood. Hi there, my name's uh, Alex Shepard. I'm uh, representing the uh, the owner, uh, Television City Hamilton, Inc. Um, so your question was about where the fencing would be located in respect to the edge of the sidewalk, and would you, you would prefer that it be set back? Well, just that it not be uh, over the sidewalk. <laughs> I, should have, I should have been clear, pardon me, but um, sometimes city standard is that it is over the sidewalk, and so I'm just trying to make sure that um, to understand that, make sure I'm understanding the drawings correctly. Um, not a drawings readings expert, so I just want to make sure I understand uh, what the story is with the fencing. So absolutely, it will not be uh, over the sidewalk. Uh, it would even. It, we're actually showing it on this drawing that we're all referencing right now is set back uh, upwards of the boulevard, um, which can be the case, or we could locate the fence directly adjacent to the sidewalk. Um, we would try to keep the fence on our property, our property line, and that's it. <coughs> Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure if the council is asking about the area specific to Pinehurst or the entire site. Uh, the rear part of the site may, uh, would be um, uh, required to meet city standards uh, and Alex's group would be preparing a construction management plan for city approval, uh, which would deal with these kind of construction access, safety fencing, those kind of things. So I'm sure Alex has heard your request and uh, will do his best to try and see how that works. But um, yeah, we would have to review uh, the construction management plan and the city standards around that, Councillor. So I can, uh, I can pass that on to our engineering staff as part of that process. Thanks, I did have other questions. So 
Um, I appreciate that, and I'm not sure to what committee that comes. If you wouldn't mind, Ken, maybe we can follow up afterwards just to find out where that little piece travels um, with respect to the sidewalk so that I can make sure I'm present um, for that discussion when it's approved. Um, I'll be blunt. Um, I live in this neighborhood. Like, this is my neighbor. This is my neighborhood. <laughs> I live across the road practically. Um, I've watched uh, and read about the deterioration of other properties in the neighborhood over a course of time. Um, there have been monitoring, as Janice says, and logs and other kinds of things that were attempted with buildings uh, in the neighborhood, um, specifically the most notorious one being uh, the one of the former Connolly, the Connolly site, the former Jane Street Baptist Church. To the extent that, I guess what the question I want to ask is, will the exact same standards that were applied to that project from that were used to monitor it, to ensure that it didn't deteriorate, to ensure that um, it um, was maintained and, and there were logs. Are those exactly the same standards that are gonna be used to monitor this? Have there been changes or improvements to the process since um, many years ago? And what those are, I'd be here, uh, curious to know because I simply don't know those. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, the Conley is a bit of a different situation in that it's a partial demolition. Uh, I think the difference with this one and, and the change in this and something we've recognized is that this building will remain intact, inhabited, and heated, um, and the applicant has guaranteed that, and we have conditions to that effect uh, in the, uh, in the um, uh, conditions for the permit. We also have conditions for if ownership changes uh, and securities, so it is a more improved and a bit more robust uh, approach. Uh, partially because it is an intact building and it will be maintained uh, as habitable and used throughout the time, uh, which is the best thing to do with a heritage building to keep it maintained. Thank you. Uh, does the city have a provision for, for the transfer of ownership and our obligations during that period of time? So if this current developer decides to, to sell this project for any reason, there are always um, a period in between, um, which is weird, um, and, there's, and there's not the obligations necessarily um, to the future owner that the current owner is obliged. Does the city have um, a means by which to, if necessary, um, step in to, um, maintain the property and then uh, pass those uh, charges on to any future or previous developer if they shouldn't choose to do so. Thank you, Councillor, for your question. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, if we look at condition four, that does speak to uh, the change of ownership as well as the security being kept in force. Um, so we do have some very specific language uh, there in terms of the financial instrument um, that we worked with our legal team on. Thanks, my more, I guess, very needly specific question is um, exactly how does that work? So um, would, because again, like the current owner is gonna keep out doing these kinds of things. If that property should be sold, like it's nice to think that the, the future owner will actually engage that mechanism, right? To do the thing of putting the security and to do the thing of maintaining the heat. But like you physically can't force someone to do that. Um, so what are the enforcement measure, measures that we have and will the city step in to do that if, the, if a future owner, should there be one, not? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, the following condition does speak to if the owner fails to complete um, any works, then it does allow for uh, the owner shall submit, shall permit the city, its employees, agents, or contractors um, to complete that work. So they sort of go hand in hand. There's the securities piece, which provides uh, the financial instrument, and then there's that permission for the city to enter the lands and complete uh, the required site development works. Thank you. Um, to that, um, I presume that maintenance uh, logs, other kinds of um, updates that are coming will be coming from the current owners to the city in a timely fashion, at, which, uh, at a time when that may not be the case if there's a sale to a future person. Does the city also then begin its own proactive um, inspections and, and up-to-date things um, so it can keep track of, of that. And again, I apologize if this is written in a language, it may be written in a language I'm not 100% understanding, so I appreciate you parsing it in plainer English for me. Uh, through the chair, the um, cost estimates do cover monitoring as well, so uh, I believe that we could use that 
as indicated in the first condition there uh, for monitoring. Thank you. I have two more questions. Um, I'm not sure who's going to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it to the ether through the chair. Thank you. Um, the word repair always suggests a reaction, almost always suggests a reaction. You can know sometimes that you have an anticipated future repair that you have to do, uh, but sometimes the repair occurs uh, as a result of something happening. Um, is there any planned preventative maintenance, to Janice's questions from earlier, any planned preventative maintenance that you think you could highlight, I suppose at a high level, um, with respect to some of the things that Janice mentioned, specifically the roof, um, that you will be engaging in over the course of the next four years, that you won't be waiting for sort of to break or to happen? I just wanna, I wanna sort of break that down in terms of preventative repairs and, and repairs that are happening over the course of four years that you don't anticipate. Uh, through the chair, I can start to address that and then I would turn it over to the owner because we are just the uh, consultant to the owner and provided the direction. It will be up to the owner to, to carry out this monitoring plan. And yes, it, we, we do use the word repair, you're correct, and um, it is a matter of uh, if you see that there is an issue with a certain uh, feature, whether it is the caulking of the windows or the, the, the drainage or um, uh, if you start to see water in ingress from the from the roof, for example, then you address that as a as a repair. Um, but we we haven't uh, done a proactive. Uh, uh, the The proactive is really the conservation strategy. The monitoring is is just that monitoring. So I don't know if uh, Alex, if you want to add anything in terms of uh, in your company's uh, approach to monitoring your your properties. Uh, yes, through you, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, obviously, we will be occupying the building full time. There will always be somebody there on a daily basis, um, so we will notice any you know leaks, condensation, um, just anything that may be visibly obvious will be noted um, and repaired accordingly. Um, I could also recommend that we have our. Uh, heritage architect uh, perform intermittent inspect inspections um, on some of the features that we may not be privy to via our eyes um, in order to uh, get on top of any further issues that may be uh, arising over that uh, long duration period. Thanks, that's helpful, that answers my question. Um, last one is more of a technical and procedural question. Um, I do find it hard on a regular basis to access uh, materials um, or did when I was a member of the public, especially things that come forward over the course of time. So I know that uh, you'll be providing a lot of documentation to staff and the staff will be approving this documentation as it meets the city's standards. Is there an opportunity for this committee to receive those documents and view those documents and make those documents public so it's easy for uh, groups like the Duran Neighborhood Association, other members of the public to follow this as it goes along and so that we can be ma made aware as the progress is happening because I think sometimes what happens is there's an approval and there's a slight um, public falling off of the radar that happens because some things happen in a, behind the scenes. Uh, as a brand new member of this committee, I couldn't tell you its motions, movements and activities but I wonder if that's something that could be done or if it's already being done. That'd be great. Through you, Madam Chair, we would welcome the opportunity to report back on this uh, as things progress. And the property is on our watch list, so that, that gives us a chance to bring it up as a topic during all of our meetings. So. Through the chair, I, I was just going to make that same point. The committee um, having properties like this that are in a state of change on your watch list is a good prompt at each monthly meeting for the questions to be asked to staff to be able to provide updates, even if there isn't a public documentation that we're able to circulate. Madam Chair, I believe that Carlos has, his, has raised his hand in the WebEx meeting. He may have something to add. Welcome, Carlos. Would you like to... Uh... Yes. Okay. It's on, it's only a brief a uh, remark that we would like to do in this case. I I understand the concern that the that everybody has regarding the some language uh, used in the in, in the report uh, when everybody sees the word uh, poor 
of course, I understand that it's a real concern. But take into consideration that uh, the building in general, none of the uh, elements that the building uh, uh, has in this moment, not even roof, uh, um, slates, uh, sealant, they could be in poor condition and they should be improved. I would totally agree with, with that. But none of them are a uh, nearing a, a functional failure or anything like, like that. That would be very uh, poor or even less unsalvageable or something like that. So yes, the binds, we agree that are always going to be a concern. But it's not some these elements that are you can see as poor. That doesn't that doesn't mean that all of them have to be addressed uh, right right away. Uh, they can be addressed as uh, if something really uh, needs to. Also, the in the monitoring plan you can see that uh, after every storm or uh, uh, once a year or maybe twice a year, we recommend to monitor all most of these uh, elements in order to be sure that. No, no change has been uh, done for the building. So that means that in this moment, none of them have uh, failed or making the building to the risk of failing uh, right away. They have to be addressed. Yes, we understand that. And that's what we put as information as part of the repair to be functional, fully functional. The slates could be, uh, some of them could be displaced, some of them could be broken, but there is no leakage or anything uh, similar to that. The building is in perfect conditions in general, and or in good conditions in general. And uh, as I said, uh, with the monitoring plan, uh, maintenance plan that is already implemented and is shown on the conservation plan, we want to ensure that if everything, minimal uh, things uh, start to happen, it can be addressed immediately. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, are there any further questions? Yeah. Go ahead. One last question that came up as a result of, um, through the chair, through uh, Alyssa's response. Um, I'm sensitive to the word public and versus private when it comes to reporting. Um, and so you said something about the documents that could be made public, right? Are there a series or any documents that um, the owner shares with the city that couldn't make, be made public? And is there a reason why those documents couldn't be made public? Through the chair to the councillor, um, that's certainly something we can confirm with our colleagues in, um, I'm trying to think records management, I'm trying to think of the correct term, but in terms of um, which, which types of documents we can release immediately versus something subject to an FOI or some sort of formal request, but we can have that conversation to, to determine whether um, these types of monitoring reports are things that we can actively uh, release or not. I'll just leave a comment on, on the record about that. Um, it's been my experience that the more transparent you can be um, in this process, the more trust everyone, it'll instill in everybody who's following and monitoring this. Um, so if there are no legal impediments to releasing documents, um, if they can be brought here, like as, as proactively as possible, because I know that it's on the watch list and we can ask questions, but to the extent that it can be as proactively done as possible so that it's out there for folks, that would be um, really helpful. Thanks. Well, <coughs> two uh, questions through the chair. Uh, the councillor brought up about wheelchair access. And um, th too often they put up these metal fences and they go, the feet of them go out into the sidewalk. And, you know, and it's nearly impossible in some locations. And I can bring it up with somebody else later uh, about a particular property, but not this one. But, you know, this, it, it can get pretty difficult to go down the street in a wheelchair without nearly getting into the road. Uh, that was one thing. The other thing, um, I, I thought, uh, member, um, Durant, I'm sorry. Oh, Janice? I talk about yeah, Janice. Yeah, yep. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> anyway, she mentioned two reports, and they seem to be of some size, and all I have is this. Uh, through the chair to Will. Will, 
I can't read on the computer, so I use my own money and I print so I can understand what I'm reading. I'm old school. Sorry about that. Oh, so, so you just <laughs> reprinted it. Nobody made a copy available. <laughs> Yeah, it's available on on uh, on the compu on the website. Uh, Loren has sent it out. I mean, sorry about that. Okay, well, like yourself, I can't read the computer, and uh, <laughs> I I still use a cell phone, and uh, <laughs> you know it's very hard to read on that one. Yeah. But anyway, okay, so it's not there. Well. Okay. Uh, so, so, Will, if you if you need uh, copies of, of any of the documentation, you just need to make the request to to clerks. Madam Chair, I can confirm that Will has requested it. We did have issues with printing some sections of the of the agenda, but we did give him what we were able to print. Okay. Are there any other questions in regards to the presentation that's before us? If not, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation? I see Councillor Crutch and I see uh, Robin. Is there anyone opposed to receiving the presentation? Seeing none, that item is carried and we move on to the report. Do we have any questions in regards to the report that's before us? And of course, the, the long list of recommendations under the, under the, the recommendations. Any questions? Seeing none, may I have a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations as seen in the report? I see Janice and I see Karen. And is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that item is carried. Thank you, everyone. I know that was a lengthy discussion. So um, we move on to our consent items. We have several sets of minutes to receive from the Heritage Permit Review Subcommittee. Um, so we have before us minutes from August 23rd, 2022, September 13th, 2022, and October 18th, 2022. Is there any questions in regards to those meeting notes? If not, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the minutes? I see Karen and I see Janice. And is there anyone opposed? <laughs> Seeing none, that item is carried. Um, and actually, just before we move on, I, I do need to thank the uh, the uh, property owner representative and, and their consulting team for, for being here in regards to the, the property that we just discussed. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer all the questions and clarifications. Uh, our next item is the policy and design working group meeting notes of September 19th, 2022. Are there any questions in regards to those meeting notes? If not, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive the meeting notes? I see Will and I see Janice. And is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that item is carried. Our next item is Bill 23, Schedule 6, More Homes Built Faster Act 2022 and proposed changes to the Ontario Heritage Act, PED 22211. Um, are there any questions in regards to this item? Uh, thank you. I have tried to read this, and from what I understand, there will be an increase in the difficulty to get pro um, properties designated. Is that I understand correctly? Could someone explain that to me exactly? What is the new um, level of requirements that will be uh, part of this? Thank you. Do you have all day, Ken? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, it's my understanding that there may be some changes to the the criteria for designating, uh, but uh, that hasn't been made clear yet. So actually, it's my understanding that actually designating is not being made more that much more difficult than what we do here in Hamilton already. Uh, the main effect is on the register. So the register will be limited to uh, buildings be on the register and have protection for two years. If they are not designated by that time, they will be automatically removed from the register with no consultation, and they cannot be reinstated in the register for five years. So when you put that together with Planning Act applications, that means it will be difficult to um, uh, designate buildings as they come forward if they're under threat. Uh, because that register protection will will be gone in most cases. 
So we are, there's a, a fulsome series of comments going forward to, um, to planning committee on the 29th um, for council to review. Uh, those, those will be public soon, so you can see. And we hope to be back in front of this committee in the new year with responses on how to respond to uh, Bill 23 and what it means for heritage and the Hamilton situation specifically. Given we have, oh, how many on the register? Uh, I think last count through the chair, 2,345 properties on our register. And we have what, 166 to designate. So we have a fair amount of work planning to figure out how to move forward with this and what to do about it uh, in the best interest of heritage in the city. So we'll be reaching out uh, with plans around that in the new year. Go ahead, Janice. Uh, yes, uh, through, uh, just to clear up, and I'm, I'm just going to follow up on Karen um, uh, and uh, Alyssa uh, Golden. You mentioned 2035. So this act is not, it's, 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 it's not going, if it passes, it will be a retroactive to all, that's what I'm trying to say. So all of those properties that we have been putting on the inventory, they're gone unless we designate them within two years. It's not, it's not something that's just gonna happen in January to anything else we plan to add to the register, if it even exists. Through you, Madam Chair, that is my understanding. Within two years of the time the bill receives royal assent, those, those properties that we have on the register now will have to come off the register or receive designation. Do we have any other questions to staff in regards to this item? Robin, did, I know you had inquired about it earlier. Did you have any questions about the correspondence? I was just hoping that there would be an explanation to the uh, committee about, about it. Um, uh, the inventory, the registration and the designation, it's all, all if we could do the inventory and can we lump them into the, the res, uh, registration? Through you, Madam Chair, once we've, uh, once the bills received royal assent and final, we'll be working with legal around the different tools we may have at our, our disposal to, to, uh, to move forward on around those issues. If there's no other questions, may I have a mover and a seconder to receive this item? I see Karen and Graham. And is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that item is received. <clears throat> Moving on to our discussion items, we have inventory and research working group meeting notes of October 26, 2022. Um, so, uh, Please correct me if I'm wrong, um, clerk. So now that we've had a fulsome discussion of and recommendations of this topic, um, basically we're just receiving these meeting notes. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, is this the time when I can actually discuss some of the things that we talked, we asked questions earlier of the presenter and then I thought we were gonna have an opportunity to discuss amongst ourselves what our next steps might be? Mm -hmm. So this is in, so we'll start with the first recommendation, which is 66 to 68. Go ahead. My understanding is that the committee did have that discussion during the staff report. For 66 to 68, but yes, but not the south. Yeah, not. The south. Oh, absolutely yes, and and you'll see in the procedures how I've broken off the second one for discussion. Okay. So our first recommendation is in regards to um, the designation of the Charlton Avenue property. Um, so this is from staff. So recommendation will be redundant after the staff report and presentation under 8.1 recommendation designation of the Charlton Avenue property. It will not need to be added to the work plan since it is already being recommended for designation. So instead this IRWG recommendation can just be received. Okay, so can I have a mover and a seconder to receive? Uh, Graham and Janice. And is there anyone opposed? Okay. Then our next um, item is the uh, Osler House, 30 South Street West. 
and that recommendation is to add the municipal add to the municipal register as a non-designated bill heritage property due to its physical design, historical, associative, contextual value, and association with Sir William Osler, renowned physician, the father of modern medicine. The Inventory and Research Working Group recommends that 30 South Street Dundas be added to staff's designation work plan, a high priority emergency, with the intent on achieving Part 4 designation under the Ontario Heritage Act. So that's the recommendation for 30 South in Dundas. Um, so is there any discussion or questions? Go ahead, Karen. Thank you for this. Um, so while I absolutely agree that the Osler House is beautiful and deserving of designation, I also, um, I know that city staff are limited in their resources, okay, and the time that has to be put towards designation, it is a piece of work. And so what I would ask then is, um, we have other properties that are at higher risk, I would say, than the Osler House. So for example, if you look at Two Hat Street in Dundas, that has been on the designation work list for, I think, since 2017. And it is the oldest building in Dundas. It's over 200 years old. And that, why that would be um, not considered higher risk than Osler House. I, I seriously think that that one is a building at risk. It's sitting there and nothing's happening with it. And how we make the decision about that all, all of a sudden Osler House becomes an emergency that needs to be designated where Two Hat Street is still sitting there and nothing's been happening. So I would recommend if we were to choose one that maybe we look at Two Hat Street before we look at um, the one that is owned by McMaster, you know, we, we believe McMaster is gonna take care of it. They've given all indications they will. We're not hearing very much about Two Hat Street and I consider that to be a higher risk. So I just put that out there as a consideration as to how we decide which to do next and where to put our limited resources. Thank you. Go ahead, Alyssa. Through the chair to the member, um, I think it's an important point to make and that's part of our existing work plan uh, as it exists before Bill 23 comes into effect, we do have that prioritization and Two Hat Street is one of those more immediate high priorities currently on that work plan. Um, as my colleague Ken mentioned earlier though, we're, we're going to be needing to reevaluate that work plan and how we potentially accomplish designations in a much shorter time frame given the removal of properties from the register um, pending this legislative change. So I don't think there's any um, danger in identifying this as a candidate for designation and staff will be reporting back in terms of how we're gonna deal with uh, the existing work plan of, uh, as Ken mentioned, just over 160 properties that are currently listed on the register and on our work plan within the time constraints that we're working in. Um, so we're gonna have to reevaluate everything in terms of prioritization and how we accomplish that. So if this uh, committee wanted to make a recommendation that that property is a candidate for designation, uh, and to be added to the work plan, then we would consider it through that reprioritization process. Do, do you mean Osler House as being added to the work plan? Yes. Through the chart, yes. 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 Okay. Grant? With uh, McMaster being a, a large presence in the city of Hamilton, is it possible to approach them and get them to pay for the CHIA to advance the designation of Osler House, as opposed to foisting on city staffs and our limited financial resources that they have? Through the chair. Uh, so it's not uncommon if uh, uh, an owner of a property were to come through a Planning Act process, an application for redevelopment or some sort of change that we would require a heritage impact assessment and a review as a part of that process. That's quite common. Um, but also uh, should a private property owner be interested in designation and be looking to potentially take advantage of financial incentives or other means. Uh, there have been cases where we've had those conversations proactively with owners and sought uh, designation sooner rather than later. So that is something that we're open to uh, pursuing. We did send a notice to um, who we thought were the appropriate contacts at McMaster. We did just receive word that that letter that we had sent uh, leading up to this meeting had just been returned. So we will reach out following this to ensure that we do have the right contact because as um, our delegate, um, Mrs. Kyles had, uh, had noted, there was just a recent change in ownership. So obviously we were, we don't have the current owners registered on title when we're looking to provide that notice. Um, so that's something that staff can follow up with and look to have a proactive conversation with the new owners.
Is there any other discussion in regards to 30 South Street? I believe Just, Robin has some questions. Robin, and then I see Janice. Go ahead, Robin. I agree. I don't think the uh, Osler House is uh, in any danger. Uh, we have a, a very good uh, owner now, uh, and it's already been uh, restored to a uh, pristine uh, situation. So the idea is, is that go for something that is a little bit more needed, needy than, than something that uh, is safe. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Janice, you're next. And I just want through the chair. I just wanted to make a point, and um, it uh, and note that it was a citizen that uh, brought this forward to inventory and research, and that of course was a Shannon who presented uh, and uh, expressing uh, concern over over this, um, and. Uh, I look at this, I, I can agree with what Karen is saying and Robin. Um, I don't believe that it's necessarily an emergency, but I certainly would like to see it added um, to the uh, staff work plan as a, a re when they reprioritize uh, that it be um, designated under part four. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Robin. An example of an emergency would be the one on Charlton. Yes. <clears throat> if I may, uh, I may have lost the thread on this, but um, the recommendation before the committee at the moment is that the 30 South Street be added to the Municipal Heritage Register as non-designating built heritage and also added to the staff's work plan. Am I hearing that this committee is not in favor of that? Have I caught no, that properly? No, the only, the only change will be where it says high priority emergency. It will be for staff to- um, I see, okay. I'll reprioritize with the, the list of- design. I'll amend the language then, thank you. Are there any further questions or discussion? If not, may I have a mover and a seconder to put forward that those second set of recommendations? I see Will and I see Graham. Is there anyone opposed? Mm. Seeing none, that item is carried. So we now move on to our item 13.1, which is our buildings and landscapes. Um, so just for the information of our new councillor, um, what this uh, list is, is we, um, we have properties that we've uh, prioritized into various categories. Each one of our members has taken on a property. Um, if there is a property that you would like to, to put your name on, you're, you're more than welcome. If there is a new property, um, I, I don't believe councillor um, Pearson was listed with a property that might need to be So what, what we will do, um, if I can start a speakers list with uh, members that have property updates that they wish to make. Uh, so we'll start with Janice. Is there any other members? Okay, go ahead, Janice. Um, I'm not an update necessarily, but I'm hoping a question through the chair uh, to uh, staff. Uh, James Street Baptist, uh, now that there is apparently new money, it appears I can't tell, the signage still says Hugh Developments, so I'm wondering about that, but I did see an additional sign attached to the hoarding, and it says Legere, I thought it said consulting or engineers. I went by fairly quickly. Um, so I'm just wondering, is, is there anything on that 13.1A number seven, James Street Baptist? Through you, Madam Chair, I am not aware of anything at the moment. I haven't checked to see if there's any new applications or anything in. Um, we can uh, have staff look into that and get back to you, Janice, if we, if we have any updates. Thank you. And I have, I have one more, if Janice, I can. Just, just, oh, Janice, oh. before you move on, I think Councillor Crutch wants to make a comment. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I'm glad you mentioned something about that property. I was going to wait till you did before I said anything. So thank you. Um, in case you had other updates about it, uh, yeah, I I have a lot of uh, questions about this property. Um, I'll I'll for now um, kind of narrow it down to one. At present, the site is um, dangerous uh, because in the winter um, the snow the sidewalks just simply don't get maintained. Um, 
And in part, this is because the back half, we'll just call it that if you don't mind, the back half of the property is just a mound of grass, debris, various bits of stone and rubble and so forth. Um, and it's been that way for a very long time. Um, and the fencing that's there is not great. So it uh, juts out into the sidewalk or juts in toward the development um, based on um, the weather and these kinds of things. I understand that as heritage folks, this is not your responsibility in terms of like every single thing that's happening to this property. But to the extent that there's actually a process for perhaps investigating more about what can be done, I wonder what can be done through this committee in terms of coming back and saying, hey, um, you know, what can be done to work for the next the new developer to do something different here? Um, if there's a time horizon of many, many months ahead, um, bringing something to parks, hopefully eventually to say, hey, can we close off this, tighten the fence area here, do something with this, the rubble area that's there and make it a little easier for people to get up and down that street. Um, it's, it's not only an eyesore, but it's extremely dangerous. It's a block from City Hall. I think we should um, try to do what we can to intervene um, if possible. Through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, uh, we share your concerns on, on that project. Um, there is, uh, we do typically work very closely with municipal bylaw enforcement for any of these kind of issues. So uh, if it's related to heritage property, we will often uh, work with them and make sure they're aware of what's going on within, uh, uh, so that they can take action, as of course we as staff can't on some of these uh, basic enforcement issues. Um, and we will take a look back. All of the staff here are new, to, relatively new to the heritage section and we're not in, involved in the original uh, uh, application for Baptist, James Street Baptist. So um, we will take a look at um, where different things stand with that and, uh, and report back or we can send you an update email directly about the status of that project if you would like. I think it'd be great to bring it back to the next meeting, even if we could, to discuss this in detail. I don't know what the current, um, I've talked to the previous owner, the one who just sold it, um, and when there were issues with respect to sidewalk clearing, I'll be very frank, I personally just emailed the owner and was like, dude, the sidewalk's a nightmare. Can you deal with this? And then he tried to commandeer something to occur and usually was successful eventually in doing so. But meanwhile, it was, it was a wreck. Um, I know that, uh, and I've attended as many presentations as humanly possible on the subject of this property while it's gone through its very manifestations. There has been some not really great clarity around the condition of the building and, and how it has deteriorated since it's been, since it's been kind of uh, closed off in the way it is. Um, and what I'm kind of saying here is two things. One, I hope the city can intervene in some meaningful way. And two, um, that meaningful way being with the structure that remains and with this potential green space area that sits behind it. Um, if we're gonna be caught in limbo again for another several years as we have been now, uh, what can we proactively do to ensure that the space is safer, uh, more accessible, more usable um, until finally something is uh, done. So that, those are kind of my thoughts. And if we could bring it back here for a fulsome discussion, that would be amazing. through the chair uh, to the councillor, I, I just spoke with Lisa. Um, I hadn't realized just at the end of last week, we had been uh, contacted by the heritage consultants just to, in discussion of the heritage permit that's currently in place. It has conditional approval and it lapses at the end of this year. So they, we did just receive contact at the end of last week. We haven't followed up yet. So that is a positive sign that there is movement happening and uh, we'd be happy to give an update at the next meeting and to, to follow up directly with the councillor as well. Janice, you're, you had another. No, you to... oh, uh, that is, I, I, through the chair, I would just like to say thank you, uh, Councillor Crutch, and thank you, Alyssa, for that. Um, and I do hope that good things are happening. Um, never give up, they say. So thank you for those comments. Oh, I got another one, though. Sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. It's another one that is a mystery to me. 13.1B, and I'm talking about 52 Charlton Avenue West, the designated building that suffered the fire damage um, and obviously had some issues with property standards and other things and is currently uh, fenced off. What? How long can that building sit that way, being vacant? And has anybody been in touch with uh, the fellow that owns it? Uh, through the chair, can you confirm the address again? Um, yes, it's uh, 52 
Charlton Avenue West. It's the former um, Linwood Hall residence. Yes. It down the street from 6668. We have been in contact with the owner. Um, and uh, we've most recently um, informed him of various uh, um, funding opportunities uh, to help with restoration uh, as he's working through issues with insurance and construction uh, in terms of being able to uh, save the building. Janice, do you have any other updates you'd like to make? Um, just is there is there a report as to why this building might need to come down? It doesn't look that bad from the outside. Uh, through through you, Madam Chair, we haven't received any application for heritage or demolition or anything at this point. Uh, our uh, last informal conversation with the owner was uh, he did intend to keep it what was but was struggling with uh, with the amount of damage caused by the fire so again my question goes back how long can a building sit on a major road in this state in hamilton is there not it i don't know through you, Madam Chair, it kind of ends up uh, discussion with the building department and engineering and safety. Uh, as a long-term resident of Durand, uh, as both and a long-term resident of Hamilton, uh, these uh, situations do happen, and I'm sure the owner's trying to do his best, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the city will do its best to be sympathetic to the heritage, but keeping public safety and standards in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other members that wish to make updates? Uh, the other question is, are there any properties that we need to add to the list or remove? Oh, Robin, do you have your hands up? Oh, okay, go ahead, Robin. Um, the Akmar Gatehouse, is there any update on the, the designation of that through uh, the work plan? Through the chair to Robin, no, no update at this point, although uh, as staff previously mentioned with the pending Bill 23 changes, we will need to address the existing work plan in a um, much different way than uh, it currently exists. So there will be discussion of that coming forward in the new year. Okay, thank you. And um, the uh, Beach Canal Lighthouse Cottage, uh, the uh, Lighthouse Group has now can have a consultant and they are assessing the uh, uh, the building, um, both inside and out, and the, um, uh, the two verandas. Just a FYI. That's great. Great news on the Lighthouse. Any other updates, Robin? Oh, okay. And if there's no other member updates, we'll, uh, may I have a motion to receive those updates? I see Graham and I need a seconder. Uh, I see Councillor. And is there anyone opposed to receive? Seeing none, we now move uh, towards our adjournment. Um, is there any other business that we need to discuss before we head out? That's it, all right. Um, if there's no other new business, may I have a motion to adjourn? I see Graham and I see Karen. And Any, anybody opposed? <laughs> no? no. Well, thank you, everyone. And the meeting dates for 2023 are going to be circulated uh, in the coming weeks. Yes. Uh, thank you. By Lorraine. So, um, so, if, the, so if, there's, if we're not meeting, I guess wishing everyone a, a happy holiday or uh, no, no Christmas party. No. <laughs> <laughs>